I realized not only could you take the skills and diversify what you actually do with them, but I realized that you could take those skills and diversify how you actually deal with the boat environment as well. Episode 113. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week again I am in the RIBA and I am talking with Chris Hildry, who is the founder of Hildry Studio and Proxy Address. He's also been the designer in residence at the Design Museum from April 2017 to April 2018, and previously uh, to setting up his own studio, he was a senior architect at Niall McLaughlin Architect where he's worked on a number of very prestigious projects and this interview joins Chris and I discussing unpaid internships and uh, Chris previously wrote a thesis uh, all about unpaid internships and the reasons why that happens and the impact that that has on our industry. The second part he'll be discussing um, proxy address which is a really innovative Um, solution to being able to give people who have been forced into homelessness um, a address, a remote address and how by facilitating people having their own address they can begin the process of rehabilitation and getting access to the fundamentals that they need to be able to survive which obviously when you become homeless not having address prevents you from being able to do so many basic things and it's a really just absolutely incredible and inspiring uh, conversation and Chris I think is a real thought leader in the industry and his sort of overview and perspective of the industry uh, is very insightful and very important so I will let you jump straight into the conversation and sit back relax and enjoy Chris Hildry. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Yeah, Um, yeah, historically the profession was, you know, um, the gentleman's grand tour across, you know, Greece and Italy and then come back and work on some neoclassical architecture was the domain of quite privileged uh, individuals and then I think now there is because of the costs involved in studying a real danger of excluding people on the basis of financial capability rather than you know architectural ability mm. I think unpaid internships just further cement that that they put another hurdle where if you're fortunate enough to be able to take part in that you get an opportunity, yeah. and if you're not, then you don't. And you know, I think I think it should be a bit more based on architectural ability or you know hunger or competence, these kind of things, rather than what your financial background is. Mm. And, and why do you think it's so it's so prevalent on paid internships? Why why would students be allowing themselves to to do it? For the line on the CV, I mean, it's the honest, you know, it's it's the reality of it that if you have a name like, you know, a, a big star architect name on your CV, then it opens doors to other star architects and those kind of things. And I mean, you know, when I worked at the star architect like firms, and I, I was finding that in my mind, at that age, I kind of wanted to, to work in those kind of places. As I got older and saw more of the profession, different types of projects, I realized that maybe wasn't what I wanted. But yeah. at that time, it was very seductive. Yeah. Um, 
And I think, yeah, people will in general want to want to have more options and not. It's very, very, it is quite, a, you know, there are tiers, if you like, in, in the profession. So, like, if you're in London and you work in a small firm, you know, of like three people or something, it's very hard to then break into a hundred something large star architect practice that's published and really well known and everything, right? If you're if you breaking down the other way around, it's quite straightforward. So it, it does make sense to give yourself the options in the future mm. by working at the ones that are harder to get into. And then if you want, you can you know, pick any one and any of the others. Yeah. Um, you'll always have to adapt. Going from a big office to small is very different. But um, yeah, I think it, it would make sense why people would want well, to. Well, it's, it's interesting. I'm not, I mean, I remember not doing unpaid internships, but I certainly worked for tutors uh, at, at, you know, um, during study for not very much, but it was it was an access to something else often. Yeah. Um, and also, I had a lot of friends who went on and did uh, unpaid internships at lots of different mm. star architects around Europe, and then that became a, a sort of starting point, like, as you say, to better get into either another practice yeah. or, um, you know, particularly part one. A place it was an, an ability to be able to move your academic career mm -hmm. into something. So if you go and say I've got a year at um, Morales, for example, yeah. and then you went on went on and made your portfolio a lot more seductive and had mm. the ability to um, go in. That that was very 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 appealing. Yeah, yeah. And um, do, do you think that 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 now it's a lot more a lot more serious? Is there a difference between how it was ten years ago to the culture of it now? Uh, of internships, yeah, you know, or practice in general internships. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not sure really because I'm not, you know, you sort of slightly leave these things behind a bit because I mean, when I worked at Neil McLaughlin's more recently, we didn't have interns or part ones generally, it was mm. part twos and above, so I didn't really see much there. And I was there for, I mean, I've had my own studio for about a year and a half now, and I was there for four years, so um, it's a good, you know, half a decade right there. So I'm not, that's half, over half the, the, the question gone. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure, but um, yeah, I've had, uh, I've had offers of people approaching me asking if, you know, can I work for you? And I'm happy to do it unpaid. Um, but, you know, I'm, not, I'm obviously not taking them up on that because I think um, that. I, I, I would expect, I would hold myself to the same standard that I would yeah. expect to pay somebody if they come and work for me. And and if I'm using them to do things that are, you know, not generating a fee, that are, you know, uh, making unnecessary models or something like that, well, no, that's on my, that, that's on me, that's my decision. I'm, I'm doing work that is non-fee paying, that's a sunk cost. Yeah. It shouldn't be for me to subtract that from there. Uh, labor value and tell them that they're not worth anything. Yeah. Um, and 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 yeah, I think you know. I mean, I work. Um, I did a. I worked with a, a, a charity called Arts Emergency at one point, which was looking at um, taking kids from kind of underprivileged backgrounds who want to study different types of arts, and it, it covers lots of things, whether it's theatre, or you know, stand-up comedy, or architecture. And uh, yeah, I worked with one person who was from very underprivileged background and. Um, she wants to study architecture, and I had to sort of slightly keep my opinions to myself. I mean, part of me was thinking, you know, maybe study to be a dentist, you know, it'll be quicker <laughs> and you'll get a little plane. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, she was passionate about it, so fair play to her. But, and, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real struggle when you don't have that much. Um, and she was fantastic as well. You know, mm. She's really, really good, really talented. And, and there, it was so much harder to get your foot in the door in places because if you can't offer yourself for free then you know you're having to fight a lot harder to, to get the experiences that other people are getting yeah um, which therefore makes it easy to apply for university which therefore makes it easy to do get the jobs you want and all that kind of stuff so it, it is a bit of a, a cycle um, mm. that I I can't imagine is getting much better I mean there's I know there's been recent talk about uh, practices signing up to maximum you know it's not going beyond contracted hours which i think is fantastic yeah uh, I, yeah part of me wishes i had, I had um, taken the unpaid overtime research and actually tried to be more active with it mm. um but i'd done it at a time when i was working as well and then work just kind of subsumed it as it finished um so i didn't really push it too much which i i, I do slightly regret but so that's why i'm really happy to see that other people are, are pushing it now and how did that research inform the rest of your career well i think 
it essentially it, it finished by looking at what we can do to to you know um, deal with some of the issues, some of the reasons why we are pushed towards unpaid overtime, and not just internships, but. Mm. <clears throat> across uh, qualified architects, even associates and so on, like any employee, um, you know, one of the things that I'd found was that 20% of um, all hours in architecture at the time was, was overtime and 15% of all hours was unpaid overtime. So it's a huge, huge amount of um, production that was, um, you know, being communicated as part of the productive capability of the industry, but it was just artificial inflation on the basis of free labor. So, yeah. so actually, I, I ended up being question, quite heavily questioning of, of the validity of some of the approaches within the industry. Um, if actually, if there's already some concerns, and that's after it's been artificially inflated, then those concerns should be taken a lot more seriously. So, so at the end of the paper, I was looking at. Um, a couple of ways to deal with it. One was standardization of um, things where the design might not be um, all that relevant, where the qualitative, the time to qualitatively assess things. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, you know, um, the amount of practices I went through where I was seeing, you know, a dozen people all designing separate dry lining head details, for example, was you know, crazy because actually it's something that had been done before and was being reinvented at every opportunity. Um, actually, we needed to look at where we're, where we're applying the important creative part that takes our time. And if, it's, if you're applying that to a head detail of a utility room wall, it, it, that's not the best place to be doing it. Yeah. You know, save that for the standardized parts. Um, so there was a, a degree of standardization from which I, I looked at. Um, the car industry is an example where they have a thing called platform sharing, uh, where you get different uh, different companies sharing the same chassis, for example, where they then install different engines and different um, different bodywork and all that stuff. Uh, similar to how Samsung provides parts for Apple phones, really. So I was looking at, at that as a way where other industries have taken essentially the sort of creative or the R and D parts and made them more um, feasible by backing them up and supporting them by standardized parts. Mm. Um, so that, that was something that I thought might be an avenue forwards. Um, the other was, was, was kind of the, in the opposite direction, which is diversification, which is this idea that actually, um, you know, architects are an incredibly, they have a wealth of skills that were taught at university. Um, but when, you know, when, when in university, the only thing you don't do is, is design a building, but you, you do do lots of other things and you get lots of skills, um, whether it's strategic analysis, problem solving, you know, making, uh, graphic design, presentations, public speaking, all these things. And then you graduate and the only thing you're told to do <laughs> is to design a building. Um, so actually, for me, there was a, a bit of a, a waste there that actually all these skills would be focused through the lens of practice into doing one thing. Mm. Um, whereas actually, those skills could also be applied to, in some ways, sort of t dilute some of the issues that I'd found that were materializing in unpaid overtime. So yeah. for instance, you know, if you had different, if a more diversified revenue stream from different sectors, if construction takes a bit of a tanking, you might be able to survive off the back of the, the momentum of one of the others. If you yeah. have different projects that some are on the time scales and the trajectories of architecture, other on, are on the trajectories of graphic design, for example, then it gives you different revenue streams at different phases and actually it starts to, to offer you know, as I say, a sort of diversification of risk. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, you know, that, that second one about diversification came to influence me when I actually came to set up my own studio because I realized not only could you take the skills and diversify how, you know, what you actually do with them, but I realized that you could take those skills and diversify how you actually deal with the built environment as well. So, yeah. So that's when I started to look at... Um, things like proxy address, where it's looking at definite, for me it's a very architectural project, but it's looking at things that are problems of the built environment whereby a building might not be the most appropriate solution in the short term, but using the skills that we've developed and tr been trained to do buildings mm. in a way that doesn't result in a building. So now I think that that's, you know, there's a reason why I called my studio Hildry Studio and not Hildry Architects, and it's because um, well, first of all, if I called it Hildry Architects, people would only come to me for buildings. Um, and secondly, it's because actually it's, it's about this more diverse 
um, array of application of the skills that I've learned through architecture. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it's looking at, it's, it's definitely focused on, on the built environment and making it a more sort of sustainable place to be, whether that's, you know, eco ecologically or financially or socially, but, but it's recognizing that a building isn't always the best answer to any given question. Yeah, and th this is fascinating, and I think it's such an exciting point in the uh, evolution of the architectural profession is that there is this widening conversation about, and it's not actually, it's, it's nothing new as such, but mm. I think architect, I mean, Hans Hollein was talking about the sort of the diversification that our architect professional will need to go through yeah. and be involved in these non-material propositions, yeah. and particularly when we're facing climate change Absolutely. and other, you know, emergencies that the, the planet is facing this, and this, this diversification kind of marries quite nicely into entrepreneurial ventures mm. and the current climate that we have of digital media and yeah. the, the, the low cost of entry into creating your own business and getting an idea out there. And the architects, we can start impacting the built environment mm. in, in an array of different ways. And university is a very nice place to start to speculate about that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think on the intangible aspect, I think you're right. I mean, when it comes to things like issues of climate change and stuff, we need to, this is why I think, you know, architects, um, and especially if in a non-traditional sort of practice, are, are incredibly well placed in the, in the upcoming years because mm. um, ultimately we know that we need to use less physical material, right? We need to churn less and, and create fewer um, pollutants and fewer wa uh, less waste and everything. And, and, and if we're going to do that, if we're going to have less tangible stuff, then we either need to accept that, you know, things are going to be less good or we invest in intangible value. And intangible value is such an important part of what architects do. And mm. there's so much experience in, in you know, being able to do more for less, to create something better that doesn't even cost as much in some cases. And, and that's essentially what we need to do as a civilization, is we need to you know, use less. But if we can make it even better by, by essentially imbuing whatever it is we create with the consideration of intangible value, that's a, that's a huge opportunity for architects, and and also I think you know we need to look at buildings where, you know, we can talk about buildings that are green, but I think also we need to recognise that I mean you know the AJ is doing this retrofit campaign for example, which I think is great because you look at some of these buildings, and I think even um, Spencer de Grey did a talk about the, the Bloomberg building, for instance, which was named you know, the greenest building <laughs> for, for years. It was like, well, would it have been greener to just not build it? You know, because actually the, the, the bronze comes from Japan, and, you know, the stone comes from China. The carbon footprint of just doing the thing is, is huge. And I think even Spencer de Grey was saying, you know, actually, it's, you know, it's going to take them well after... Um, uh, where they thought it would in order for mm. the actual the, the environmental benefits of the building to cancel out its carbon footprint. Um, so actually I think we need to we need to look in a very holistic way about what we do and I think architects are really well placed. Yeah. Well it, it's like that lovely story that I think Jeremy Till sometimes recounts about um, the school that was having problems with overcrowding in its corridors mm. and they sent out this competition mm. brief to a number of architects and um, you know, they were getting back all these kind of entries of redesigning the school, tearing it down, and they were costing in the millions. And the headmaster ended up sort of um, getting into a conversation with one of the um, student's parents whose oldest son had just started a little architecture practice and, you know, spent an afternoon with the two young designers and they came up with a proposition of actually, rather than doing anything with the building, actually redesigning the timetable yeah. and putting an extra a bell in the in, yeah. the, in the studio. Yeah, now yeah. that is an architectural proposition. 100%. Yeah. And that is what, like as you say, it's what we're brilliant at. And, and you know, there is this huge latent opportunity to mm. be able to kind of diversify, go into these non-material ways mm. of production and thinking about the city and actually solving real problems yeah. um, which are impacting us and society that are using the built yeah. environment. And I think as well, there's a, there's a really important um, conversation to be had about, about how to get the value of intangible value <laughs> recognized in, in, you know, 
you know, because the temptation there would be to say, great, I'll give you 20 quid because now I just need to change the timetable. You know? Yes. Or as actually somebody else would be getting the fees for it. But actually, I would say, um, you know, they should be getting more or less the same fees for that. And I mean, there's another... I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna forget all of the specifics of the story, but it was something like um, there was a. It was, in, it was in America. There was this really famous engineer. I think it was the 1920s, and uh, there was this uh, company. I think. I think even it was something like Ford was developing this plane engine, and uh, suddenly one day it broke down. It was incredibly expensive, and so anyway they paid to fly this guy out and, and inspect it and he sort of put his ear to it, gave it a tap and a knock and stuff and just put like a, a little chalk X on it. And then he walked away and like went away again and he sent uh, the Ford company or whoever it was um, a bill for something, you know, $50,000 in, in old money. And like, this is ridiculous, like I need a breakdown of all your costs, blah, blah, blah. And so he sent the breakdown of the costs and he said, you know, um, placing chalk X on engine $1, knowing where to place the X. Forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. <laughs> you know, actually, because it's you don't pay somebody for for the action involved in in answering a question. You pay them for the years of experience and training it's taken for them to answer it quicker than somebody else yes. and in a different way. Yeah, and, and and it would be crazy for us as architects to kind of charge by the hour almost mm. because you know, well, for starters, as an architect, as you get better and better and better, your ability to be able to look at a site quickly and mm. make kind of propositional calls and yeah. and ideas on that that's you know your hourly rate has got it's going to cap yeah. out at a point and yeah, also yeah. when you put it in the context of you know like you like that demonstration like the the context of how much money you will be making say a property developer mm. with your ideas or your intellectual property over the not just over the kind of you know, not just at the sort of the initial uplift at planning and then yeah. the final uplift when the site is sold, but throughout the entire course mm -hmm. of, of that building and the impact it has on people's lives. Um, to have a conversation about how much you're getting paid by the hour is a bit nuts. Yeah. And as you've already highlighted, the sort of the huge resource that's actually involved, you know, and also the, the huge resource that's naturally involved in architectural production, as well as the inefficiencies that many architects um, practice with by mm. trying to restart things over and over, the conversation about how to communicate value mm. is, is so key. In, in your experience, as you've worked with some great, you know, you've got a, 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 quite a wide range of um, working with large practices to, um, to smaller practices mm. to run, now running your own practice, how 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 what is a strategic way for architects to communicate value? What are the sort of key ingredients there to to have these kinds of conversations? Well, I think I'd say ultimately um, it, it, it's always a difficult thing because architects are, as a, as an industry incredibly difficult to to ask. They find it difficult to to ask for money generally speaking. Yeah. Um, it's it's not a not a problem I found in a lot of other <laughs> industries. Um, but I think it's important to to you know to have confidence in your worth uh, mm. for sure because you know it, it, one of the old sales things about you know people will will judge your value on what you advertise the cost as being you know if you see a, a bracelet for ten pounds you think okay fine if you saw the same bracelet for five hundred pounds in a jewelry shop window you think you think better of that bracelet even though it's the same thing so the the perceptual anchor point of actually making sure you put good values against what you're what you're doing um, but the reason why I start with that is because actually otherwise I think there are you know, it, it's a bit of a Pandora's box it's very 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 difficult to solve um, mm. in architecture because architecture has some constraints that are very very difficult to fix so for instance um you know it's a speculative service uh so we don't sell people a building that's been designed we sell them a design that will result in a building and you know i think there, there was a case of um Mies designing i think it's the crawler house where he built the entire house one-to-one -one in hessian to get the get the actual client to understand the spaces but you know, we can't all do that. Um, <laughs> and so what we're faced with is how do we communicate what, I mean, you know, architects are very good at visualizing inside their head, but there's no USB on our temple, right? So how do we communicate across to people? So yes, we have plans to communicate to other um, technically proficient um, uh, 
people in the design team, but in terms of communicating to a client, we have visualizations, we might even have VR or AR if, you know, if we're up to that, which I think is going to be, will be a huge benefit. Mm. Um, but ultimately, you know, the amount of times that I've seen clients not quite understand why the architect is worth so much, until they visit the building for the first time, yeah. and then they're like, wow, you know, this is amazing. You kind of wish you could have had that reaction, you know, like 18 months earlier when you're actually pitching. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's one problem. The other is, is actually in demonstrating the value in, in a way that the market, you know, in the language of the market, which generally speaking is done with by, you know, by using control variables, demonstrating impact. But it's very hard to do that when every project has a different client, a different brief, a different site, you know, a different budget. Like, the, the, uh, there are very few control variables across buildings. Mm. So, I mean, you mentioned, you know, Jeremy Tool's school uh, story earlier. I mean, I, one of the things I did for a period was, was we worked on schools. And it's very, very hard to say, you know, the architecture has improved this school in a way that is purely in the language of a market. Now, you could say, for instance, oh, we redesigned a school and now the grades have gone up by, you know, 20% increase in A's and B's, right? But it, those are different kids. You know, you're not sending the kids back to do the exams. They're different kids. There might be different teachers, there might be different timetable, different syllabus. There's no control variable there. So it's very, very difficult mm. to actually. Yeah, there's, take no, there's no simple pieces. split test here with, that, with our architecture. No, exactly, exactly. And, and, and the other thing is, you know, uh, because of this, it, it, that makes some, some natural inefficiencies in, in, in the profession. Because uh, whereas, for example, uh, you know, if you take an iPhone or something like that, again, you design it once and then you spend a lot of time on R&D and then you release it and, and you make millions of them. Yeah. And, and you can sell millions. And with architecture, you can try and reuse some bits here and there, but you can't just pump the same buildings out left and right and you know it's very obvious when that has happened in the past um, but also with, with something like a, an iPhone you know you I wouldn't have thought 10 years ago that people would be spending you know a thousand dollars or maybe a thousand pounds on on a phone um, but you put it in people's hands and people who are like no I'll never buy that and they're like oh this is so nice like oh yeah I could yeah this is definitely worth it mm. um, is this just a thousand pounds like suddenly it changes because they experience it yeah, and and the sort of proof is in the pudding. Whereas if all you've got, if you imagine trying to sell that phone when you've just got drawings of it, and you're saying like, oh, this is going to be a great phone, <laughs> or even yeah, well, that's three D that you can even spin around. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's it's not the same, and so it, that's a real challenge. Like mm. all these things are real challenges for architecture that other industries um, might not face, or at least face in different ways. It's a very, it's almost a unique profession in that. And until we overcome some of that, um, some of those issues. Or uh, not overcome un until we even just accept and come to terms. So, so when I did my research into unpaid overtime, for example, one of the things I did was I looked at how the industry had tried to overcome this problem of translating the value, the, the sort of qualitative, intangible value of what the, what the architects bring to a market that is generally looking, mm. you know, with the exception of private resi where the person you're selling to will be living in that building. Yeah. Um, if you're talking to developers or, you know, corporates or things like that, actually the person you're selling to is not the person who's going to be living Using or working it, yeah. in that building a lot of the time. So their language of assessment value is completely different. In a sense, you know, in, in the sort of triangle between the end user, the, the client and, and the architect, there's a short... So there's, a, there's an aligned interest between the architect and the end user, but the person paying for it is actually slightly different. So you have to end up <laughs> translating it to their interest to surreptitiously get the interest of the end user through sometimes. Yes. Um, which is a bit of a challenge. Now, um, one of the ways, uh, one of the things that had happened in order to, to try and ensure that this value for the end user was carried through that middle stage of going to the client which you know already sounds like an absurd situation, but it does happen very often. Um, is you know bodies like, for instance, Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment (CABE) okay, were invented. Um, now, their job was almost to act as you know protective layer during that process to make sure that what's being proposed is of sufficient quality. Um, now there are various difficulties there, but one of the things I found was that they had done reports with a group called. A Eclipse Consulting, I think, in Cambridge, uh, 
looking at how to translate the value of architecture. Essentially, they're, all, they're always asking. There are so many papers and talks and things about how do we communicate the value of architecture to mm. clients. And um, there was this table in one, one of these things, and, and it, it had taken down these different values, and it was a, it was a wonderful mix of, like, you know, Vitruvian values and, and Marxist values. So there was uh, what well, Marxian values. So there was like exchange value, labor value, use value. Um, these things from uh, that I had looked at as part of this research that I didn't expect to see in a cave document. Yeah. Um, and then you got towards the end, and all these things you can think, okay, yeah, it's easy to quantify this, this, this. That's fine. And then at the end was this column um, or this row for wow value. I was like, I really picked them up on this. I was saying, you know, well. Just because it's in a table doesn't mean you've quantified it. Like, how, what, what is wow? Yeah, yeah. How, are you, how are you giving wow, wow value? Because actually, like, you can put two people through this, and one might give it two, and one might give it ten. Like, I mean, how how has this overcome the difficulty? And I mean, after I pressed them a little, they did they did kind of you know not come clean. That suggests they were trying something on the hand, but like. They, they accepted the, the fundamental principle of what I was asking, which is that, you know, it wasn't a quantification mm. of qualitative elements because you can't square that circle. It's a different thing. Yeah. So I'd say uh, we need to accept the limitations in what we do in architecture. But if we're going to ask for our... Um, yeah, I think rather than try and push what we see as value onto the clients, I think we need to think the other way around because we're never going to get qualitative value expressed constantly, um, the, the, which is actually quite a good thing. If you if you quantify... Well, no, exactly, because then you, you want to have a sort of degree of, you know, of, of quantifying it with your price, with your fee. Well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you quantify joy, the first thing that's going to happen is it gets value engineered. You know, you're going to design a school that's amazing. It's like, do these kids really need eight joy? No, let's give them two. <laughs> like, let's make it a bit more depressing. Let's value engineer that down. So it's good that there's some things that aren't quantified because it's easier to include them. But I would say that the better way to, to actually get, to, to realign, I suppose, the, those three parts is, is, to, is to get the, the to, to, sounds very patronizing, but almost educate the clients or at least get mm. the clients to value the qualitative aspect of it and the only way they could do that in a short space of time is for them to see the quantitative essentially commercial impact of of appreciating the quality so therefore it means getting the end user the public the people who have some vague say when they end up being um the market yeah to demand these things which will push it through so then it turns into a whole cultural shift and you know now we're talking about very very big problems so from an architect's point of view, you know, um, it, it's a very, very big, nuanced problem that just runs through the DNA of architecture and the market at the moment. That if we're going to change it, it will require, you know, decade, you know, a decade, a decade or multiple decades, I think. But it will be a cultural shift. Yeah. For me, I think, um, you know, as somebody who runs a practice, I think I, I don't look to. Uh, I don't rely on uh, a cultural shift like that happening in order to make what I do feasible. Yeah. I think for me it's about negotiating around the reality of the situation. Um, so being able to um, highlight things that are of constant value and really push the value of that. And if there is something that is qualitative and perhaps isn't being valued as highly, well, then I won't assign it as higher value in those calculations, but I'll raise the value of the quantitative side, for instance, yeah. you know? So, yeah. actually, because it all comes as a package when you do these. Or the other way, which is by far the best, is just get a client who actually is aligned with you. <laughs> and, and I've been fortunate enough to have that. So uh, And they get it already. And it's, they get it already. They see the value in designing something with well, quality. It, it, it's, it's interesting as well, because this is, a um, you know, this idea of being able to communicate our value, and this mm. is the, you know, you hear this as a dictum kind of spouted out all the time, of, with little kind of meaning behind it. It's just a thing that's said, and we need to do this, and this is what architects need to do. And it's a very loaded, complex thing, as you're mm. as you're discussing. And you know, you know, the for a, well, first of all, it also takes us as architects to be able to understand what are the emotional drivers behind a particular client, and like you've mm. illustrated. Um, so some clients are looking at our at our architecture purely as a financial instrument. Mm. So in order, in order to better bridge that gap between 
end user, client, and ourselves as well. Our capacity to be able to speak with, you know, with some kind of financial fluency mm. and align our align ourselves initially with understanding the business cases yeah. Of, yeah, yeah. of clients, that at least opens up a new conversation where they feel like they're going to be heard about yeah. something. And, they, and if they can trust and have yes. trust in yeah. your competence and understanding that you understand what is important to them, yeah, that's important. I mean, the, I've been, since I've been doing uh, Proxy Dress, for instance, and you know, I've been having quite a lot of meetings in sectors that I wouldn't have experienced as an architect. And... You know, if I've introduced, if I've been introduced as, as an architect or a designer, sometimes, you know, yeah, I can sort of sense a little bit of an eye roll in the corner of the table or something. Because what you're dealing with is people who deal with, you know, um, management, spreadsheets and deliveries and things. These are nothing to do with buildings and stuff. It's about to do finance and systems and regulations and stuff like that. Mm. And, you know, for me, I, it, the way I overcame that from an early stage was to try and know more about their own business and them. Mm. So I would usually typically try and try and start off by like throwing in some technicalities and things and just sort of you know a little litmus test yeah exactly just a little sprinkle of like <laughs> ISO oh. regulations or, yeah standards and regulations and things just so that they know what I'm talking about and once you have their faith in that once you know once you've demonstrated that like um, you know the nuance of, of essentially like the crap that they have to put up day to day with you know if somebody feels that you understand what it's like to mm. be in their shoes then that is actually like a much more of a, of a connection and people have People can feel like you're capable of empathizing with their situation. I think that that often doesn't happen enough in architecture where you might have project managers who, who frequently roll their eyes at architects uh, on construction projects. Mm. Because quite often they, they feel that architects don't get it. Yeah. And I think if you can show that you get it and you realize that, yeah, everybody's facing a you know, storm of difficulties here. If you can get that you can empathize with their difficulties, then, then it's really big help. Yeah, and, and, and that's something that um, is so important yeah. for us to communicate as a, as a profession, as a, as a whole profession, is that we are competent in yeah. those other areas of particular, you know, particularly when it comes to finance and business cases. Yeah. And that kind of myth that architects don't understand business is absolute, mm -hmm. it's nonsense. And it's really unhelpful yeah. for, for, for both us and clients. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just opens up a, opens up a whole sort of new conversation. Yeah, and the other thing I'd say, you know, on a sort of macro scale as well, is is there's there's another difficulty in the sense that you know if if we can be seen at the moment to be in some cases um, putting across proposals that are sort of like what we want to do wrapped in what we think the client wants. <laughs> And then we fling it through the client who then, you know, takes off the wrapping of the, what they want and gives it to the end user. And finally, that's how we got it through. Um, there's also a difficulty in the fact that quite often, I think, the, the, the profession seems to feel that the, the end users aren't actually appreciating it. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, it's not like we're, it's not like there are rallies outside the window saying, you know, bring us more architects. I mean... <laughs> and, but, we're, like, but, we're, but we're seeing the very real life effects of this, particularly with things like the Grenfell Inquiry yeah, and yeah, yeah. The, the sort of the chaos that ensues with the procurement process where architects yeah. are kind of, um, well, where quality, mm. is, Frank, is not the, is not the main agenda. Um, yeah, and, and I think in that case, I mean, you know, that's a very specific one where the, there is obviously a lot of, a lot of issues there. Um, what I think people, especially, you know, when it's reported in mainstream media, people find absurd is is the sheer um complexity of the relationships and and i was looking at that you know the the very well read um dmb map that came out as part yeah of the diagram of yeah. the riding and all yeah, yeah yeah and i was looking at that and i was thinking you know yeah i've been through that like yeah that makes sense that this is happening this is happening because it's like it's it's like a temporal map splayed out in 2d like there, there's there's not even a third dimension it's a fourth four dimensional thing mm. you know it's, it's over time as well um, but I've, I've worked on projects that, that, you know, have been just as complicated as that. But, like, obviously, um, the, the issue, I think, is, is when it comes to actually reverse engineering the, the, what happens. This is where I think part three does prepare you quite well in the sense of, you know, knowing that you should write every email as if it's being read aloud in court. Like, it's very, very, very important um, to have good quality assurance standards in architecture. It probably the most, you know, important thing mm. because a lot of people might be tempted to just okay, let's just go get this thing built. But you need to be able to reverse engineer the entire 
process of events. Clearly, I don't, it doesn't look like that's happened in, on the Grenfell case, but when you do look at it, um, I think a lot of people who aren't involved in the industry are shocked that it's not like, you know, having a plate of food and, you know, oh, let's separate out the toast from, you know, a bit of fruit or something. It's like trying to separate melted parmesan and a bolognese. Like, the whole thing is just, there isn't even a thread, you know. It's like, you have to go down to the molecular level to really understand what happened if it's not documented properly. Yeah. Because it just appears informal. Yeah. And like a mess. So, good quality assurance is important. But, but the other thing is, I think, and, and, and again, this has kind of come up or been sort of um, implied, I think, in, in some parts of Grenfell, and this, this is this is as a tangent. This is not not talking about the much more serious and significant issues about obviously people losing their lives and that, but just purely from the abstract sense of of a, of a professional um, context. I think there is an issue whereby you know at the moment a lot of people just aren't actually as interested in architecture as architects, mm. and I think. Um, Architects find this hard to come to terms with, but it's vaguely true, and I think I think part of it is that actually, um, for most people, um, you know, cities are things that are imposed upon them. You know, most people don't have a say in, in what their built environment is. Yeah, and and that is 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 a challenge if you want to get people engaged. You know, when we talk about how do we communicate to the wider public the value of architecture. <laughs> you know, actually, most people don't care any any more than like you know people are having conversations somewhere you know about tarmac associations. Say, how do we get people to care about the right tarmac? Well, I've never cared about like you know unless I'm specifying it in a yeah. landscape. But you know, like every industry has has well, these things where actually I mean, it's, it's the most important world. But yeah, and, it, and it's interesting. I mean, something like like the example of, you of tarmac. You, you, yeah. you don't care about tarmac until you've hit a pothole. Yeah. And it's those kind of key moments yeah. that 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 are the, that make it real for people. Yeah, but and that, that, yeah, that's a big issue with design is that you always notice bad design. You, you don't, you know, bad design and exceptional design, exceptionally good design. And the middle ground is is not really talked about that mm. much. And but for me, I think, um, yeah, I, I think as well. There's, there's another part of this which is you know, if architects want to feel relevant and things, and but. <laughs> I, mean, I remember in one of the first, um, you know, part one lectures, and you know, you we're taught, you know, architects are one of the great professions. You know, there's doctors and architects and lawyers and things, right? But like, um, I was saying this to somebody recently. Um, you know, actually, if if you need a doctor, you really need a doctor, right? If you need a lawyer, you really need a lawyer. No one in the history of mankind has really needed an architect. Like, actually, what we do is a luxury service, mm. and if we don't understand that and accept it then we can continue to question the sheer, you know, madness of the general public by not appreciating what we do. But it's it's just hubris at the end of the day. If we don't actually take a look to a moment to look in the mirror and see that, you know, actually, you know, if you if you relate it to to clothing or something, you know, most people buy their clothes in like Primark or Topshop or whatever, like high street chains. Mm. Like architects are tailoring for people who get tailors. Yeah. Spoke clothing, yeah. spoke buildings, you know, and and the idea that uh, we're mystified as as to why people are not more interested in tailoring, well, it's because most people can't afford it for one, yeah. you know, and and also, it, you know, it is essentially a luxury service, and so unless we actually engage people more in the process, and I mean more than you know, public consultations or planning notices on lampposts, unless we actually engage people in the pro. Um, in the process, and we actually start to do things that are more relevant to people's lives, then we're not going to find that architecture is more relevant to the broader general public, because quite frankly, it isn't that relevant to yeah. the general broader public. Um, it, the process of it isn't, obviously the end result is. But until that happens, then we can't expect the general public to push and demand that clients demand it as well. So that's what I mean when I say about you know, the cultural change, is, is we can see when things go badly, and that should trigger people to ask for things to be done better. Mm. But generally speaking, it just triggers people for them to ask for things not to be done badly. Um, <laughs> and 
there, there needs to be more engagement and you know it's not like I have the answer to this I don't have yeah. like a seven step guide but on how to do this wait, wait, but. and it's interesting as well because it's, it's not like it's not necessarily like the case of the iPhone either where you've got a, a market where you can compete necessarily mm. you know the, the the supply of housing for example in the UK is just like it's it's throttled yeah and you know it's a it's a builder's market mm. essentially it's the people selling the, the housing that's got the control over yeah, you, yeah. You, like, get, which means basically you can sell crap because mm. there is just such you know people are willing to take yeah such a such accept poor quality it's, it, basically they're not able necessarily to experience the different mm. types of um, joys that architecture can bring because you, you don't either don't get access to it because it's exclusive like, mm. like you're saying or it's just you know the housing stock that's that is available is just that's what it is so you've yeah. got the best of a bad bunch and then there's a kind of cultural acceptance of you know mm. of, of what you end up living in because that's what your finances dictate yeah and I mean from an architect's point of view as well it's like well what can we do about that and 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 actually the problem is as an architect you know we never get asked what should be built. Like we're asked to design what is going to be built. It's already been decided. There's yes. already a slight like client budget. Yeah. You know? um, and then we get asked to design it. And, and, and in, yeah, that housing, I suppose, like, you know, Barrett type housing is a bit more like an iPhone because you design it once and they employ architects and then roll that out. Yeah. Like this tabula rasa of, you know, middle England. But, um, but in those cases, um, we don't have any agency really to affect what's happening and, and this is one of the things I was constantly frustrated with in, in architecture is is we're very far downstream mm. and until you know it's not it wasn't my job as an architect to you know I knew how much we needed more social housing and affordable housing uh, but it wasn't my job to do that that's policy makers jobs it's, you know householders mm. to be informed by policy makers because they're laying down policy like that's not my jo job as, a, as an architect and and, you know, if we want it to be, it can be, because you can start to branch out and do other things. But if, it, if you want to, if you're an architect and you're looking to try and influence what houses are being built, you're not going to do that through the lens of building buildings. You're going to do that by questioning things higher upstream, perhaps getting into policy making or engaging with policy makers or that yeah. kind of stuff, you know. It's broadening that horizon of what architects do and where they apply their knowledge. Yeah, um, and, and like, like you say, there's the, the kind of non-material propositions as well, mm. which, which leads us on actually to talking about proxy address, because mm. you've you mentioned it a few times, and for people that perhaps haven't come across it, or what, what is that? Because it's kind of related into, um, into being able to provide a non-architectural or non-physical solution to something that's quite... Uh, you know, impacting a lot of people's lives in the built environment. Yeah. Um, so what Proxy Address does is it provides um, stable address details for people who are entering or in homelessness. Um, and the big, the big problem is that essentially the address system that we have in, in the UK was it was only bought in the late 18th century, and, and it's gone from describing a location or being how we orientate ourselves around a city to being a de facto form of ID. So when you lose your address. Um, you lose access to the things that you otherwise would need. So yeah, if, if you're made homeless, you suddenly lose access to things like you know, getting a GP or a bank account or uh, getting posts or being able to apply for jobs, getting benefits. All these things are taken away mm. because of the very reason you need them, which is an incredible catch-22 that's yeah. harming so many people. And you know, today the biggest cause of homelessness is, is the end of a private tenancy. It's not mental health, it's not substance abuse. Most people who are entering into homelessness today are doing so fully capable of recovery. But they're not recovering because they're suddenly cut out, cut off from, from all the support they need. So it's actually turning what should be a dip into a cliff face, whereby mm. just because you lose your home and your address, you, you've got nothing. Mm. Um, now that leads to entrenchment and development of mental health and substance abuse issues and things like that in a lot of cases. So, yeah, with Proxy Just, what we do is um, you've got a sort of network of different stakeholders and, and essentially what we do is we use records of, um, of empty properties as well as uh, others and we provide the address details as a proxy for somebody so that when they're facing homelessness, even if they're just before homelessness, mm -hmm. they can be given an address that stays with them. It never changes no matter how much they move. So we have postal redirection, we have all these things that actually you can still do everything as normal just with one address. And the main reason that works is because actually when people need your address these days, most of the time they don't need your location. They need the data behind the address. 
So, you know, if you buy a plane ticket, for example, and you have to give your address, yep. it's just so if John Smith 1 and John Smith 2 both turn up to the terminal, they've got to differentiate it. It's, it's the same with like credit reference union, bank checking, anti-money laundering, all this stuff. The problem is all that data is fixed to your address because it's just gone through the scope creep. Mm. So when you lose that, you lose all, it's, it's essentially like a, you know, a pin in a wall and, and, and holding, uh, being held in by that pin is all the data that people need to understand that you are who you say you are. So you take the address away, all that data just falls away. Right. So what we do is we use existing records of properties and we just replace that pin. And because we do that, we, well, because of the way we do that, it has no impact on the original property. It has no impact on the post, the credit rating, the security, any of that. So, um, so is it a real address that's being used? Yeah. It's a real address, but, yeah, so yeah. It, but, it, but, it's, but it's now vacant or it's now... Well, so uh, yes and no. So it, we, it depends on where we're sourcing our address from. So right. we have different sources. So we use, in each case, the address comes with explicit consent. Right. Um, which legally we didn't actually technically have to do. Um, but what we found is obviously there are enough that we can have with explicit consent and so why raise why put your head above the parapet yeah. in that because with some stakeholders it was an issue of reputational risk and, and are people going to get the wrong end of the stick and find it scary so we worked around that which yes. is fine so yeah, yeah. it only comes with explicit consent so you know if anybody's at home screaming, you know, are you going to take my address? No. <laughs> Although, yeah, I, I'll come Although back. you could. <laughs> well, this is the thing, actually, because this, this is, is a really interesting thing. Like, what is an address? Because mm. if you, you know, you, you say things like, you know, are you going to take my address? But it's not your address. If you buy a house. It's an address. It's an, it's an address. It's, it's, a, lo it's a, a location. House, yeah. So if you buy a house, you don't buy the address. You don't own your address. If you ever receive junk mail, that's someone using your address without your permission. It's not illegal. And by law, an address has to be visible from the street. You can go down any street, as long as you don't care about who's behind the door. You can go down any street in the UK, look at the street name, look at the number on the door, that's an address. You can scream it out loud. You're not breaking GDPR rules, right? It's mm. not sensitive information. Mm. And the local authorities and the uh, uh, raw mail, they make between them the postcodes and the um, street names and numbers. So it's, it's public information. You know, you can type any address into Google, you know, you can say aloud, you know, 14 Grosvenor Street, there you go, that's an address. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. It's public information, yeah. not really owned by anybody or yeah. any particular IP. So, um, oh, it's interesting, isn't it? There's a, there's a, there's a cultural attachment to, absolutely. Know, to, to the address, that's mine, that's a kind of... Yeah. We, we, we wrap up all sorts of things into it, whereas if you said, you know, what's your GPS coordinates or it's a very different... You don't have the relationship with that. Yeah. It's essentially the same, the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And, and really, once you divorce the, 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 the nature, once you separate the, the address from the location, uh, it becomes a very powerful thing. Mm. Uh, because ultimately, the, you know, think about how often you use your address. Most times these days, I, I find it, it's not that I'm asking someone to write it on a letter or anything. It's, it's actually I'm inputting it online to prove who I am, who I say I am, right? It's, it's on a mobile phone contract or it's on a you know um, clearance uh, form for something or you know that kind of stuff so actually um, the analogy if you like is, is comparing proxy address to the old addresses old addresses are kind of like a landline phone and proxy address is kind of like a mobile phone so if you call a landline the first thing the person says on the other end is, is who they are right if you call a mobile phone the first thing they say is where they are you know I'm on a train or, right um, it's because in the first case you know where you're calling, you don't know who's picking up the phone. And the second, you know who you're calling, but you don't know where they are. Mm. Now, if the address is going to be used as an ID instead of a location, for the people who need that more than anything, well, let's make it more like a mobile phone that's attached the address to a person, not to a location, and then actually have it follow them around consistently. Yeah. And also, I mean, I mean, there's lots of other things we can do it as well. So, you know, um, with the post is just using, you know, simple redirection, but depending on what type of homelessness you have, uh, you might be moving very frequently or at short notice, or you might be using a care of address at a homeless shelter. We can work with the, every circumstance. But it does mean, let's say, for instance, you're at a homeless shelter and you're applying for a job, which is very common. Uh, mm. A lot of people have jobs and are homeless and are using homeless shelters. If you apply for a job and you have care of homeless shelter on that application, you don't get a call back. You know, yeah. the stigma of it alone is enough to keep yeah, people yeah. away. So with this, it looks like a residential address, but it still works just the same. So basically, it ensures that people are judged according to who they are and, you know, what they're capable of and by their own merit, not mm. by the situation they find themselves in. Because, you know, somebody who is homeless 
is in the situation of homelessness. They are not a, you know, person, a homeless person in inverted commas. You know, it's not who they are. It's where they are at that point in their life. Mm. And and it's really important that that, you know, those things remain available to people. I mean, like, I, good example with the bank account. So we're just about to commence our um, first trial in London of proxy address. And we're, we're starting with the, the very hardest thing in terms of anti-fraud compliance. Right. Because uh, that's obviously the first question I get. If I, if I go into a big stakeholder meeting and say, right, we're going to get homeless people to use addresses they don't live at, usually it's the lawyer who's then sat in front of me saying, okay, what? <laughs> um, so anti-fraud compliance is very, very important. Hardest thing to do is open a bank account because you've got to apply with, comply with anti-money laundering laws, uh, know your customer laws, basically ID fraud, and countering the funding of terrorism laws. So, you know, they take these pretty seriously, as you might yeah, imagine. Yeah. Um, and it's the hardest thing you can do. So that's, as I say, why we're starting there, because if we demonstrate that, because it means nothing for me to say advan- in advance, yes, we comply with it. Obviously, mm. I've designed it, so it does. Um, but if we can be demonstrably complying with it, you know, and, and actually demonstrate that, then it unlocks it. Everything else is like a piece of cake below that. So with a bank account, you might think, well, most people actually will probably already have a bank account. And there's a couple of things on that. One, yeah, bank account isn't the be-all and end-all of proxy address. It's one of the things we do. We yeah. also make sure we get people you know, GP access, get them on the electoral register, get them job applications, the library card for public computer access, all these the, huge amounts of things. Um, so it's one part of the puzzle. But even on its own, it still has validity. So like I was speaking to somebody in a shelter, for example, and she had left an abusive relationship. And by virtue of that abusive relationship, the only bank account they had was a joint one mm. that he controlled. Mm. Now, she ran away from her abuser and essentially found that she wasn't able to be independent. Because as soon as she ran away, she couldn't open a bank account because she had no proof of address. So that now she can't get rent payments done, so she can't get an apartment. Now she can't get universal credit, so she's got no income on benefits either. Mm. You know, she can't do any of these things, can't get a mobile phone contract, can't do any of these things. So actually, she, by, when I spoke to her, she was just about to go back to her partner. It, seems, it seems insane that, that, that um, the most vulnerable people become totally you know, dropped. It's, this like, really like, like, hit it, me hard. It, it, it was it's just like, oh, well, hold on a minute, Jesus. It was horrendous. Um, you know, I, I, I felt like a little embarrassed to, to think. I remember at the end of one particularly long day that like, oh, I found it was really like hard. <laughs> like I felt embarrassed because, well, yeah, me finding it hard hearing about other people's hardships is not a hardship. Um, but it's just the sheer variety and nonstop nature of how people are being left to drop. Like you say, and, you know, there's no, you expect a safety net. And there's things that you and I take for granted. Mm. Um, you know, most people take to some degree for granted their safety net of having, you know, savings or family or friends. But, you know, some people don't have family. You know, some people have, have families who are a direct danger to them, you know, who don't like them. I mean, I, I never really considered that fully until you're speaking to people who've been through, you know, a care background and stuff and they had to get pulled away from their parents who were yeah. a danger to them. And, it's all these things that once they start to get, um, once you start to strip away everything you think, everything you slightly take for granted. Um, you know, I'd spoken to somebody who 18 months earlier was a, a GP with a wife and a mortgage, and you know, 18 months later his wife had died. Um, he had lost his job, he ended up with an alcohol problem, and mm. he was on the street sleeping rough. You know, somebody whose parents had died, he ended up sleeping, on the, uh, sleeping rough for about four years before I met him. And, and the effect, it, the effects are so bad. So the average age of death of a rough sleeper in the UK today is 44. Right. Right. That's nearly half the UK average. The lowest national life expectancy in the world is uh, Sierra Leone at just over 50. It's right? so six years lower than that, and we walk past this every day. But rough sleeping is, you know, it, it's a smaller part of the proportion of homelessness than, than we tend to think. It's the most visible. Yeah. But there's huge amounts of people in temporary accommodation, in private B&Bs that are put there by the council sleeping on friends' sofas. Like, the problem is much bigger than we think. I mm. mean, I think Shelter estimated one in 200, I think, maybe, uh, are facing some form of homelessness in the UK. It's a huge number, you know. Um, so what, what, what brought your attention to this? And, and not only that, inspired you to do something, actually do something and execute it and, and go through the huge energy that's required to make something like that happen. So the, the catalyst for this was um, 
while I was working at Neil McLaughlin. So I, I was project architect at the time of the Natural History Museum project, mm -hmm. which was on site. And and as anyone who's done site work will know, I sort of there's a, a bit of a, a hump, and then it sort of as things all being well tend to go smoothly, it starts to get a little quieter. Now at the time, I could see that on the horizon, so um, I, I sort of had my head turned by this thing I saw called the Designers in Residence Program at the Design Museum. Um, so basically, um, I got onto that, and each year, basically, they take four designers uh, from across the country in different disciplines, so like an architect and product designer and speculative designer and all this stuff. And um, so I was, I was doing four days a week at Neil McLaughlin's and then three days a week um, art design museum. So it was a long year. Um, the idea is that they give you a one-word brief each year and you have to respond to it. So the one-word brief that year was support. Right. Now, I had, I had tried, as, as most people do, to sort of, you know, my first starting point was to post-rationalize something I was already doing and see if I could fit it in. Um, but then I actually had a moment where, I was, uh, first of all, like, I was struggling to do that. But then I really thought, like, well, actually, why am I doing this if I'm going to post-rationalize it? Like, I've spent so long post-rationalizing stuff. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a skill I particularly think is, is helpful in the long run. Um, I should just be honest about this and do something that I think, you know, maybe in 10 years' time I can look back on and think, oh, that, you know, at least I tried doing something yeah. good, essentially. Um, and I, it, the, the idea about um, addressing and homelessness was something I thought of years before, but never, obviously never gone anywhere. Um, and it was something where I thought, um, it would be worth looking at. And when I started off, it, I started off in this position where it was, it was a really, you know, crass approach to try and deal with it. I, I had focused on the postal side, which is actually a really small part. Mm. As I say, it's mostly about identity. Um, so I'd focus on the postal side and, and I'd thought about how to, you know, retrofit post boxes to the back of street signs, for example, that are always at the end of a road, um, which... You know, immediately it sort of came to light. That, but what about some, you know, somebody's dignity? If they're seen going up and opening this thing that is known to be the homeless person's letterbox, mm. that's very hard. And and so immediately that nuance of, of dealing with people and and emotions and dignity and their story actually started. It, you know, I really had to go back to square one. So so I spent many months going basically up and down the country, speaking to people in in shelters and. And that was for me the the turning point when I realized well I heard you know the stories of people who were very generous with the time and very open about it um, I realized what was actually happening and and how bad it was and yeah. then that was you know more than enough to to motivate me to to actually do something about it but you know by the time that that exhibition came around and um essentially you know I had this concept but it wasn't wasn't a reality by any means you know it sort of worked out and I'd done a lot of research and, and that was the research that got the President's Medal in the end actually yeah um, so the research was all there but at that point um, it was kind of a concept and I remember having a bit of a, a bit of a conversation with the design museum because they, they had obviously put me in this program as an architect and I think probably they pictured a you know a model on a plinth at the end of it and you know it's like what are you going to exhibit it's like oh an intangible system <laughs> bloody hell <laughs> um, so there's a lot of conversations about is this architecture and and you know for me Absolutely, it's architecture. I mean, um, or, okay, it maybe it's not architecture. I probably wouldn't say that to, you know, a member of the general public. But I would say this is what architects do. I, I, absolutely, I think, in that sense of what is architecture, I think, I think that it is. Because it's shaping the built environment. And, you know, if, if I had looked at this problem and only decided to approach it with, you know, a, with my options being a building or walk away... Mm then there's, there's not a lot I could have done. Instead, it used my understanding of the built environment. So, you know, if you're working on a construction project in, you know, uh, X Greenfield site or something, you need to have what's called a not yet built postcode. They basically give you a temporary address so that you right. can send people to delivery, to, to send deliveries to site in what would otherwise be described as, you know, bottom left of field or something. Um, so I knew that the addressing system was, you know, flexible in the same way that I knew that the built environment is is adaptable, you mm. know, and most people, most people see the built environment as a very fixed thing because they have no agency within it. As architects, we know that, you know, you can change things. Absolutely, as long as there's money there or, and will, you, you can change these things. So I knew that the addressing system was no more a sort of tangible obstacle 
than than a city would be. Um, so I, I do think it was it was down to my architectural training to let me look at this problem through an architect's eye, to say, okay, well, there's a system in place that we take for granted. It doesn't have to work like this. How can I change it? Mm. Um, and then, yeah, after I mean, basically, what what happened after that is, I mean, the the exhibition was the first. So the, we were the first people to work in the studio in the new design museum in the, the old Commonwealth Institute. Um, the visitor numbers, because it had moved recently, were, were quite high. So we got, like, I think it's a quarter of a million people come and see our exhibition. It was amazing. Wow. Um, but off the back of that, then it ended up in, I think it was like Wired magazine and the Times and things. And then so it started to like get the attention of some people who could help to make it a real thing. Um, and so those conversations started. And again, it, it came down to showing that they could take me seriously um, and, and making sure that I understood what, you know, what, where they're coming at the problem. Because, you know, I mean, if, if I was going into meetings saying, you know, if you just change the way your nationwide operation works and spend 30 million pounds, look at the impact we can have. That never went well. If I can go in and say, you don't need to retrain anyone, you don't need to spend much money at all, and look at the impact we can have, that's much better. So a lot of yeah. my work was meant it was spent understanding the constraints of the reality rather than just kind of expecting people to change, to, to meet my expectation of the world. Yeah. Um, and that was a, a big difference for me, the actual process of, you know, the, the design process was, a lot of it was about the design of, um, of how the thing interacts around reality. And, that, and that's also quite a, um, quite an architectural thing. Mm. I mean, I, I know as a designer, as an architect, I work a lot better with constraints than I do, if, you know, like in university, for instance, if I had a project that's like, here's a field design house, I would just have a blank piece of paper for basically two weeks. Yeah. Like if somebody, like in Edinburgh, for example, there was so many constraints, different levels, and if somebody says, okay, here's a really tight site, do something, there's so much to play with, and I can immediately start working things out. It was similar. If I'm dealing with, you know, financial regulations, anti-fraud reg regulations, banking regulations, postal regulations, like there's a lot of things that are in the way. And that's what kind of Inform informs my design. So it was quite analogous in that sense. And then now, as I say, we're coming up to this live trial where we've got, um, so we're working with the financial regulator themselves, the FCA, um, Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, We'll be doing it in Lewisham, and we've got um, three banks on board, only one of which I can say, because the others are yet to be announced quite soon. Um, one of them is Monzo. Um, the other two are, um, one's a similar challenger-type bank, and one is a very large bank, which is good and quite exciting. Um, but yeah, people like Ordnance Survey and um, RSA, and people have been very supportive, HM Land Registry. Um, what's What's been sort of the major kind of milestones in developing this as a, I think what would you call it? Is it a business? Is it a charity? Is it, how is it, how is it structured? So it's a social enterprise. Social and, enterprise. and this is something that I, I was a very deliberate decision because, um, and something I gave a lot of thought to. So if, essentially I was, I was faced with having to decide between um, kind of four main versions between a, a CIC, a kick, um, a charity, uh, a, a profit maximizing limited company or a yep. social enterprise. And I went for social enterprise because Obviously, it's not a profit-maximizing company. That's not what this is. Yeah. I think that, that much is evident. Um, I've been working with uh, or alongside quite a few charities. So, for instance, we're partnered with people like Big Issue and Crisis, and we're helping get Big Issue vendors contactless payments uh, through bank accounts and things. And the charities are... Um, the, the world of the charity is actually quite quite a hard one to operate in. Um, there's, there's various bits of funding, but it's finite and they all have to compete for it. Um, and and your, your income is quite dependent, essentially. Mm. And what I always wanted this to be is <clears throat> uh, financially sustainable and independent as an entity. Because um, I don't want to have to, for instance... I mean, I've, I've turned down some VC funding, for example, because it wasn't quite the right time. Yeah. Because what it's, the impact of this for the people who need it is the most important thing. And I don't want to start seeing... Now, this was a good VC, a very socially minded one, which is great. But I don't want to start risking the dilution of that at this stage. 
But if, you know, if this is a, a charity and I have to spend a lot of resource on applying for funding and stuff, it's a very different thing. So I knew I didn't want to do a charity route. Um, so for me, a social enterprise was a perfect balance where, you know, it, it's, it's got an asset lock. So, you know, it's, it's, its social mission is locked into the government documents as is an asset lock. So it means we've got to um, invest a certain amount into the business, all good causes, if there's nothing to invest on in the business. Um, and it's all about maintaining the, the social mission as the primary objective. But is it can still make money in order to enable it to not be dependent right. on relying on grants. So um, for me, the idea is to make sure that it has the independence to retain its positive impact and not get distracted by people, perhaps, who might otherwise prioritize commercial interests. Right. And so does that mean, by, um, in terms of an asset lock, you can't doesn't have any private ownership to it, or you can't chop it up and sort of sell shares in it? or so, th so this is why it's a good compromise. So you can still sell shares, but obviously, if you're, let's say you're approached by a venture capitalist, and they, see, they recognize that at least 50% of all the profit is getting reinvested into good causes, the only ones who will still be left in the room are, are the ones who you probably want to be working with anyway. Yeah. Because it's not profit maximizing a lot of like the traditional VC fund who would be coming to you and saying, you know, we're going to come in in a series A and expect like 1.25 multiplier by the time you exit. Yeah. Those aren't the conversations I wouldn't be having. Like, actually, this is not about, you know, this is not like we work for homelessness. Or anything. <laughs> this is not about build it quick and maximize all the profit. Like, this is about helping people who need help. That's that's it. So, so for me, it's a lot of. It, there's been a lot of decisions that have shaped the sort of um, the, the 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 company, if you like, that have all been pulled back to that anchor, mm. which is what's the best way to enable that to happen. Um, yeah. And so, where is it right now in development? So, um, I say, well, it's coming up to this first trial. So, the idea is that we work with these banks to get um, bank accounts set up with people from Lewisham, which is council, we're doing it in London. Um, it's part of the Financial Conduct Authority's regulatory sandbox, which is a sort of system they use to test new financial instruments while protecting the market, should it all go yeah. horrendously wrong. <laughs> um, which, you know, touch wood, it won't. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, basically we'll be doing that trial and, um, you know, speaking to people, and we'll be measuring success both, you know, quantitatively and, and qualitatively. You know, there's no point in, like, saying, oh, people became more financially engaged and there was, you know, more salary payments than they previously had and they avoided hmm. this and that. Unless you can also say, yeah, and the person's actually avoided homelessness as well and they're clearly happier and they've got better mental health and stuff. Like, you need both parts of these, of the puzzle. Um, so we'll be doing that uh, throughout, the per throughout the course of that. But then following that, I think that there's a... It, it's not going to go from one council to boom. I mean, there's more than 400 councils in the UK, so we're not just going to go from one to 100. The idea is the, the massive underlying principle of this whole thing, and which has made it quite unique as a startup, is because I've, I've been, you know, since I've been doing Proxy Address, I've sort of been surrounded by quite a few tech startups, essentially. Yeah. And, and it's been strange because, first of all, it's been quite a new world for me, but it's also been strange because my mantra is like the opposite of most tech startups. Like most tech startups are build it quick, fix it later, get mar dominant market share. Build that audience. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, exactly. Like reach that capacity quickly. Um, on, my, on my side, I, I've had to basically, my, my decision around speed is balanced between wanting to get it in people's hands as quickly as possible to make beneficial impact versus making sure above everything it is robust. I can't go around to people like in a year's time and say, oh, we're just going to patch a few bugs so you can't go to the GP for three weeks. That's not, that's not okay. I can't have it fail and people stop, can't get the universal credit. Yeah. Right? Like, if this becomes what I see it as being, it will be a lifeline for people who have no lifeline. And I can't risk that failing. So rather than kind of like this tech startup of building the, the tallest, thinnest spire to get as quickly as possible, you know, up into the sky. Yeah. I'm doing kind of I'm more like a pyramid. So like it's very, very stable, but the first one, the first layer takes the longest. Yeah. And then everything gets quicker after that. But that's why I've started at the hardest thing with the anti fraud legislation, for example. Right. But it also means the longer you spend on the first layer, the higher the peak goes, right? So it's yeah. always worth it. So it's a, a long-term 
Yeah. Thinking and long-term vision. Long-term thinking, long-term vision, balanced with... And it's architectural in its nature as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stru- structuring it. <laughs> I'm not comparing it to the pyramids. <laughs> um, but, uh, but also, yeah, balanced with making sure that it's happening as quickly as it feasibly can while complying with needing it to be robust um, and safe. So, you know, for instance, we need to make sure that if people are setting up bank accounts, they're not being exploited. You know, these kind of risks that you might not immediately consider. Things like money mulling, you know, people who want to money launder money, we approach vulnerable people, say, okay, stick for that £5,000 in your bank account and send me 4500 of it, you keep 500 That's then washed clean money, and there's a lot of people exploiting people like that. Um, so we need to make sure we've Gosh. got all the checks and balances and alarms in the system to make sure that works. And so the, the second part, anyway, will be more... Um, more functionality. So we've obviously focused on this banking thing for the purpose of that keystone of anti-fraud compliance. In the second one, there'll be more councils uh, beyond London, more scope in terms of the actual um, the workings of it as well. So I think that's when we'll be rolling out the big issue thing. Mm-hmm. That's when we'll be rolling out some of the other things. So um, perhaps even if we can in the first thing, we're, we're currently uh, in talks with um, TFL to potentially... Um, get anybody with a proxy address free travel across London, um, which would be a huge help because at the moment, if you have, um, if you become homeless, you have so many meetings and appointments, and let, let's say you miss a you know a universal credit meeting, if you just miss one meeting, you get sanctioned for between one month and three years, right? And, and universal credit, for those who don't know, is is all six forms of benefits. So, you know, job uh, job seekers allowance, child allowance, housing benefit, all these things, all through one tap. So if you miss one meeting, that tap is completely off for, you know, one year, uh, sorry, one Mm. month to three years. I've met people who've been sanctioned um, because, you know, they they were five minutes late for a meeting and they get sanctioned, like, no benefits for three months. This is why we have so much food bank use now. It's so precarious. And, yeah, I think 2013, the, the Red Cross started its first nationwide food aid program in the UK since World War II. Like things are really bad, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm slightly sort of going off on a tangent there. I've almost lost my train. Of well, thought. I, I was uh, going to ask you, what what's the? Does it have? Would you want to use it for any other other reasons except for its, its social purpose? Like, yeah, yeah. Does, does I mean, it have yeah, other the, other applications? Yeah, there for are. There's a definite sort of large commercial case to be for it to be used as well. I mean, there these these needs that um, are faced by people who are. Yeah, some of the most vulnerable in the country are weirdly mirrored by some of the most affluent as well. So if you're a high net worth individual, your transience by choice is is actually quite an inconvenience in some parts. So even, for instance, the security, a lot of especially wealthy people uh, use PO boxes, for example, right? Now, my, my point with the proxy address to illustrate how that works is you could put your proxy address on your keys. They'll leave your keys in the street. They can post your keys to you but they never know where you live. It's kind of like a VPN in that sense. You know? Right, so yes, it's, it's a security delightful. thing. Yeah, so there's a kind of security provision there. So there, there are absolutely different um, ways to, to commercialize this, um, whether, you know, students, people in houseboats, traveling community, all these people. Um, but I'm not going to start with the luxury service. And this kind of comes down again to, to things I've learned from architecture. You know, yeah. when I worked on Natural History Museum, I enjoyed... You know, I didn't even consciously recognize I enjoyed it at first until until I had hindsight that, you know, I enjoyed the fact that it was working for making things better in the sort of civic sense, you know. And and then if I went back onto private resi and, you know, it's like, oh, another £200,000 staircase, like, that's never going to be seen by anyone and the guy's only going to live there three weeks a year. Mm. Like, that's not actually that fulfilling. Anyway, it's not actually... Um, that interesting. So, you know, not only for my own personal interest in the sense of wanting to do something that is, you know, doing some social good full stop, but also knowing now, since starting the project, the sheer urgency involved in people, you know, in people's situations. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I once did a lecture where I finished and, and somebody asked, you know, a question about like, why didn't you start with with the commercial side? Mm-hmm. I, I was slightly, my, my mind was slightly boggled. I was like, well, did you not just hear those stories about like 
what people are doing. <laughs> um, I don't think I said it out loud, but uh, <laughs> but you know, it was like, like well, this is obviously so much more important. And yeah. it's only when you've actually, you know, for me, it was when I, when I actually sat down and spoke to people like that, and you, that's when you realize, like, well, I mean, a, a good illustration. So as, as part of the Design Museum exhibition, I had a, a sort of wall of video screens where I had interviews of various people. I think it was maybe like 30 people and probably, like, let's say, 20 25 people uh, on there were homeless people, but there was people who weren't as well. There was like somebody from the House of Lords, somebody from different organizations and regulators and that kind of thing. And it was mixed up, so you could see the amount was talking. And if there's an important quote, it would be on a different screen. So the idea was that, you know, the words are important, but you shouldn't be judging people by whether or not they're homeless. It was kind of like a secondary point to the thing that you yeah. couldn't tell who was and who wasn't. Now that exhibition was up for about four months, and then by the end of the exhibition, about five of those people who were homeless on the screens had died. Like it's four months. Like every time I go back to one of these shelters, somebody else who I've been speaking to has died. Like it's really like bad. And the thing is, we don't we don't actually see that very mm. much. You know, like, as I say, we we see rough sleeping, um, but we don't see the people who are just like us because most of them, you know, if if you or I were made homeless, you wouldn't want to be seen in that state. You know, for a lot of people, actually, the hardest thing is that first approach to somebody to get help because. Most people don't want to accept that they're homeless. They don't want to admit it to themselves. Feels to them like they're having to put their tail between their legs, and you don't want to be seen doing that. So actually, a lot of it, the work is invisible, and the people working, helping, are doing so much good stuff. But it's not, you know, homeless, not, homelessness is not the tip of the iceberg. It's the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, while there are, to answer your question, while there are commercial ap aspects to it, um, you know, for me, it's about getting the impact first and foremost yeah um and then yeah by by all means i can look to you know move on and apply it in different ways extraordinary chris thank you so much My for pleasure. your time that really has been an absolutely phenomenal hearing you talk about both your your studio your practice your expertise and your insights on the industry and as well as the incredible work you're doing with proxy address thanks so much i appreciate it and that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.